please join me in welcoming Lydian Lee, who will be talking about running Beam multi-language pipelines on Flink clusters with Kubernetes. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, so this is my topic. And before we start, I would like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Lydian Lee, and I work in a firm uh, on, a on the streaming infra team. And so my personal specific uh, specialize in data streaming and also machine learning, machine ML ops as well. And so besides that, in, gen <laughs> in my daily life, I'm a cat lover. So this is my cat. His name is Boba. <laughs> it's really cute, cute to let me. And so, uh, so before we start, I would also like to give you some ideas about Affirm. So you might already know that Affirm is a buy now, pay later company. But I would like to give you some numbers so that you know that the data that we are handling. So right now, we have 16 million active users. And in the past quarter, we have like 14.3 million uh, transactions. And also, you know, we are actually a B2B2C company. So we have collaborated with uh, 246,000 uh, merchants. And so these are kind of like the data that we are trying to handle every day. And so the talk today, I will first uh, share the Affirm's tech stacks. And then I will ch uh, share why we choose Beam and also the challenges that we have and the final architecture that we've come up with. And also to mention that compared to with the, follow, uh, the before two talks, the differences between us is we have to handle the Python. And the reason is because in a firm, there are major, we do have Java uh, developers, but most of the people in a firm are Python developers. So it's really important for us to support Python. And the other things is um, we currently using a Lambda architecture. So the Spark, um, we, we have the batch processing very early and very well uh, built, and it's on top of Spark. And uh, the streaming infrastructure is kind of built recently, much more recently. And right now, we are working on uh, using Flink and Beam to keep improving that uh, experience. And because we introduced the uh, Beam, and so our machine learning team is also trying to figure out if they can switch to the Kappa architectures so that they can use Beam for backfilling. And they use the same code for backfilling and also uh, real-time feature engineering. And so a quick look for our tech uh, for streaming infra. So the source data are mostly uh, Kinesis and Kafka. And we are actually migrating from Kinesis to Kafka, but this is like a transition step. So we have both right now. And then for the process engines, we have the EKS uh, Kubernetes on AWS. And we run the Flink jobs on top of that Kubernetes. And to help uh, bridge the gap for the Python and Java, we are using Beam. And finally, the sync, we have, uh, we are mostly on AWS. So we use AWS 3 for <laughs> storage. And also uh, for database, we use Amazon RDS. And for the data lake, we use Snowflake. And last but not least, you can also sync to another Kafka topic for your next one. And so uh, next, I want to talk why Beam is a really important thing for us. Um, so. According to our user, Beam actually offer a really user-friendly interface for them. Um, most of our users are n already known how to um, write a Spark app. So it's not really too difficult for them to learn how to code in Beam. So that's a good thing for them. And also, um, because the, the Beam is seamless integrated with the Flink operators, um, and this is be able to uh, kind of making our integrate with our CI, existing CI CD very easily. So this is uh, another good thing that why we are choosing Beam. And also um, the unified interface also give us a future potential that so that we don't really need to write multiple codes for the same thing. One for one just for backfilling, the other one for uh, real time feature co calculations. And, but as I mentioned, that Python is really important. And so the Beam, one more thing that Beam supports is kind of key things for us, which is the multi-language support. And so as you can see on the graph, um, you can submit your application in Python. And even though you're, but 
but when, because we want to use Kafka, and the Kafka I.O. is actually written in Java. And so in order to support that, um, you will have your application support uh, submitted to the Bing job service, and Bing will be able to translate that and, in, and send the task into the task managers. And in the execution engines, um, you will be, uh, the, the Bing will be able to run uh, either Python or Java based on the every stage. So this is kind of uh, the reason why we want to use the multi-language support. However, when we try to introduce this multi-language support, we do see a couple different challenges. And the first one is the expansion service um, is by default is starting in a Docker environment. And the second one is uh, when we run this architectures, uh, when we run the pipeline, we also found that our test manager is unable to locate the artifacts that the job service, uh, the expansion service created. And finally, um, this is much more probably a firm only issue, but maybe apply to your company as well. So we do see that the final create, build Docker image is a little bit too big. So we are trying to handle this one as well. So for the first one, um, the expansion service, by default, it's always start as a Docker container. And this could, this is totally fine for other environment, but for Kubernetes, you know, we run the jobs in pod. And in pod, you can, and so, which means that you will want to start another container inside a pod. This is not doable, this is not, I, I wouldn't say it's not doable because there's a workaround. So the always solution people are as suggesting online is either using Docker out of Docker or Docker in Docker, the DOD or DIND. But then the problem is, as mentioned in the previous talk, the good things for Kubernetes is the isolation. But when you are applying this kind of DOD or DIND, you kind of break up that, those isolations. And as a firm, we are a fine fintech company, and security is our top priority. So we're definitely not going to go over with this approach. And so, um, so I have to find out in other ways. And luckily, um, after some search, uh, some queries, on, uh, I, I think I asked in the user mailing list, and someone pointed me that you can actually, we, the, um, the expansion service already have equipped with the capability to start in a different approach. And it's just unfortunately, it's not really documented somewhere. But the final solution that we have, for example, this is from the Kafka I.O. So when you start the service, um, I think by default, usually you don't set, specify the expansion service. And, and but right now you have to because uh, you want to provide a, a extra arguments. And the extra argument that I want to provide is, I, I need to provide is the default environment type and default environment config. And so with these two config sets, um, then when you run the, when you, when you start the Kafka I.O., it will know that you want to start the expansion service in the, in the process instead of a Docker. And that actually solves our problem. So right now the Docker, um, right now the expansion service is no longer another Docker container. And, and instead it's a process. And actually, I talked to someone uh, with Google t yesterday, and they are saying that in future, they potentially going to move this expansion service and other and, and, and a separate service so that it could probably make these things much more easier to impl uh, in the implement in the futures. But for now, I think this is what we found the best solutions. And um, next is, uh, the Flink Task Manager are failed to locate the artifacts. And we found that the root cause is like the default artifact, uh, default artifactory, artifact fact, uh, directory in job managers because we, uh, we will start the Beam app in the job manager. And so the Beam job service and artifact service are all on the same pod. And it's by default using a local folders for that. And we've tried to, um, different way, trying to configure that, although it mentioned that in the documentation saying, you would be able to set up um, using like a Hadoop or S3 or GCS as your uh, storage for artifacts. But turns out that the expansion service doesn't really honor that settings. 
And so far, we were unable to find a solution for that. So we kind of used another workaround. And by the way, if you know that how to do that, I'm totally happy to talk to you. And, and so the way that we are doing is instead of uh, setting configure that in the S3, we do uh, share volumes. So for our job manager and test manager, they just share a same volume. And that kind of get rid of this uh, unable to locate artifacts the issues for us. And last but not least is um, a firm is working as a, a microservice team. Of our service is like a microservice. So every team will have their own Docker image. But we also share some uh, company-wide uh, tech stack. Uh, sorry, tech stack. So those dependency is already huge. And we our image have to build on top of the a firm base image. And because that a firm base image is really large, and if we want to add the Flink and Beam dependency, right now I'm just saying those jar files things, it probably adds uh, around like 500 megabytes data uh, into the layers. And for and and if you consider on the use user situations, because everyone, uh, because you are because we are Python and we adding these jar files, and most of the time you won't actually using it. And because you want to run a job, you, you are a Python web server, why you, want, why you need the streaming infrastructure there. So it's kind of like we create that, if we add that into our Docker image, it's kind of a waste. And also causing extra by handling those um, uh, data layers there. So instead of doing so, we kind of uh, build our own Kubernetes webhook. So uh, if you are not familiar, Kubernetes allow you to build your customized webhook so that you can do any modification on your Kubernetes part. So this is the final solution that we came out with. So we build a webhook, and when people are submitting their Kubernetes job, uh, their Flink jobs, we also ask them to add certain uh, labels with the version that they want to use, and so that when uh, our web webhook notice that, hey, this deployment has these labels, then we will inject this init container. And the init container is just the pre-built Flink image with those dependencies. And then we, sh we just copy all these dependencies into the, uh, into the actual image that will run runs things. So that we don't really need to pre-build these things into the Docker image, and it's also going to give us some flexibility because we, when if we want to, uh, trying to bump a different version of Flink, we don't really need to ask our uh, users saying, "Hey, you need to rebuild your Docker image for this certain version." Instead, they can just specify the labels in their uh, Flink, um, in their uh, CRD. So um, this is the approach that we are having. And so to summarize, this is the final architectures that looks like. So on top of that, this is the Flink operators. And the Flink operator, we, um, this, just to clarify that, we have this project started uh, in past e last year. And so by the time when we're working on this project, there are only three operators available, the Lyft one and Google one and the official one. But the official one is kind of like a very, very, very early stage. So we definitely don't want to be the first one to use that and handle those different issues. So, and by the time the Lyft one is much more mature and we know that people use it in production. So we use the Lyft Flink operator instead of the, um, the official one. But it's kind of similar things you, in, if you want to really swapping them, at least for our use cases. So for the Flink operator, it launched the Flink uh, uh, it launched those uh, job manager and task manager for you, and it also mo monitor the status. So it, once it, the, it noticed that the Flink cluster is fully ready to go, it will trigger the Beam runner jar in the co in the job manager part, and the Beam runner job will create start those required service, the Beam job service, expansion service, and the artifact staging service. And in the same time, it will also trigger our Python process to start running the, the actual pipeline we have. And then uh, the Beam job service will create, uh, will do all those trans uh, translation work so that it can be submitted to the Flink job manager. And the Flink job manager will help do the work on distributing the, work, the works into the test managers. And for test managers, given that, for example, we are using Kafka IO, so it has to start the Java worker 
in order to get the message from Kafka. And once they get the message back to the Flink test manager, we have our own Python uh, user-defined functions. So that uh, it will launch another Python worker harness, which underlying is a, another Python process to run our code. And then just it, uh, in the real situation, is it, will, it could be have multiple following tasks there, but for simplicity here, so you know that it can be able to run either Java or Python at the same time. And so the final conclusion that the lesson we learned here is that um, doing the configuring Kubernetes framework for Beam interface actually present a lot of challenges. And most of the time, the challenges due to the lack of the documentations. And so hopefully by introducing this, uh, giving this talk, we can kind of bridging those gaps and you don't need to um, <laughs> suffer what we have been through in the past years. And so, and yeah. And also well, I want to mention that uh, we will also post the same, uh, more detailed information in our tech blogs soon. So if you are interested, feel free to uh, connect to us via, via that channel. And thanks, questions?